Hello and welcome to this Energy Tech webinar, Utilizing Tiny Clouds to Monitor Large Air-Cooled Turbo Generators, sponsored by Environment One Corporation. Our speaker today is Ron Brosnahan, Vice President, Products and Markets from E1 Utility Systems Business. Ron leads the E1 Utility Systems business as a trusted producer and advisor to the electric utility condition monitoring equipment market. My name is Kathy Regan and I'm Energy Tech's editor. I'll be your moderator today. During this session, Ron will look inside of the world's earliest warning hotspot detector and its further emerging service in power plants worldwide. He'll discuss risk mitigation specifically and how you can protect your assets during this session in which the technology and strategy behind condition monitoring for air-cooled generators is covered. The presentation will last approximately 45 minutes and will be followed by a Q&A session. Ron, you can go ahead and begin. Well, thank you, Kathy, and thank you folks for joining us for today's presentation on the generator condition monitor for air-cooled machines. In the presentation, we will discuss some of the drivers supporting the increased monitoring of air-cooled machines. We'll cover some background on the base technology, which will hopefully help explain the title of Tiny Clouds. And then we'll do an in-depth review of the GCMA system and the application itself. So let's talk a little bit about what's driving the need for increased monitoring of air-cooled generators. The first point is that air-cooled generators are playing a much more significant role in baseload generation today than they have decades ago. In fact, probably 15 to 20 years ago, the most common size generator, air-cooled generator, may have been a 50 to maybe up to 100 megawatt unit that would have been used for peaking conditions. Today, 200 to 300 megawatt units are prevalent in baseload portfolios. The increased significance of these machines certainly lends itself to increased monitoring. The next driver in increased monitoring would be that periods between outages are becoming more extended. Adding additional monitoring to these air-cooled machines helps bridge the gap between inspections and helps reduce the prospect of failures due to something that was missed. Operating conditions are also a stressor to these air-cooled machines, especially in the area of unit cycling, where mechanical and thermal stresses are present. Finally, and certainly not an exhaustive list of all of the drivers supporting increased monitoring, is the aging workforce. Nearly a half million plant personnel will be leaving employment over the next 10 years. And based on everything that we see in the industry, those half million jobs are not likely to be refilled. This will lead to more people doing, uh, less people doing more work, which again, only goes to reinforce the value of increased monitoring of these significant assets. The risk variables are increasing. There's little question about that. And really, that's what this presentation is all about. How do we help mitigate those risks for plant operators and utility owners? So let's look a little bit at uh, generator failures, the thing that we're trying to avoid or help avoid at least. In the following couple of views, you'll see some very typical failure modes for generators. The first is 
insulation damage to an end winding. We can note this through the discoloration, especially in the left-hand portion of that photo. Next is a classic core burn. In the lower left-hand corner, we'll see an end turn, uh, a burn section of an end turn, which may have been uh, caused by vibration, or either mechanical or uh, thermal stressing. While these represent typical failure modes and maybe ones that might even be called most common, in our experience in the world of air-cooled generators, there's another factor that comes up, and I think it's worthy of mentioning here, and that is damages caused by foreign objects. Probably relating to the unit cycling and thus the increased mechanical stresses on machines, we've seen a number of instances or have had plants contact us to ask us about our ability to detect the presence of hardware that may have been loosened or if a, a bolt or a nut may have become loose or jarred loose uh, and then have even just a small burn mark within the generator. Will our system respond to it? Uh, we're, we're pleased to note that we will be able to detect even small burns uh, from a foreign object, but I do certainly believe that uh, this area of foreign objects, whether it's from the machine itself or loosened components or objects that are left in a machine after a maintenance outage are, are worthy of, of mention here. So as Kathy had mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the GCMA represents a tool in risk mitigation for plant operators and owners. The GCMA focuses on monitoring insulation degradation, overheating, and arcing. At the heart of it, is the cloud chamber detector. We'll spend a decent amount of time regarding the cloud chamber during this presentation. And it is one that has been, uh, this technology has been in place for decades. We often like to lend a little bit of attention to complementing technologies to our risk mitigation products. And in this uh, application on an air-cooled generator, we certainly want to point out that a complement to the GCMA is partial discharge monitoring. We won't be covering partial discharge during this presentation, but we certainly believe that attendees to the webinar uh, would be well served to increase their knowledge of this valuable technology. So let's look at a little bit of the history behind our base technology, the cloud chamber. Uh, one thing for sure, it's been proven over the course of decades, uh, ranging from military applications to mission control and uh, a host of places in between. This slide is really a matter of just to, to reflect a little bit on the fact that it has proven itself over the last 50-odd or even more years. Early on, this once military classified technology was used in World War II to detect snorkel submarines. In another wartime application, in desert and jungle warfare, cloud chambers help identify hidden enemy encampments. Now, this is because it was able to identify the products of combustion, uh, which could be from anything from a, uh, a dinner being cooked somewhere to a diesel submarine's exhaust. In the area of high value asset protection, the cloud chamber currently protects the US Constitution and Declaration of Independence at the National Archives Rotunda and it protected the Hubble Space Telescope as it was 
located at Mission Control's Orbiter Payload Changeout Room. These examples show that the technology has been used for quite some time, has provided great protection for high value assets, ranging from computer rooms to large rotating machines. And it's a pleasure for us to focus in on the technology here over the next half hour or so. So let's go back to the discussion that centers on generators and talk a little bit about overheat detection. Overheat detection in generators has typically been left to embedded sensors, which are typically located uh, in the machine and provided as part of the original scope of supply by the OEM. These would include RTDs and thermocouples. These sensors definitely work. They're connected to the plant DCS, and they provide a valuable function. The one limitation is that their detection capability relies on proximity to an overheat event. So well, certainly, if we have an RTD location and an overheat or a hot spot develops a couple of, a couple of meters away, that hot spot is going to have to progress to the point of potentially being a catastrophic event before an RTD might pick it up. When overheating or arcing takes place in a generator, byproducts of the overheating or submicron particles are released into the generator cooling circuit. And that's where the focus for E1's technology and the GCMA can be found. In hydrogen cooled generators, there's a closed loop cooling system. And because there aren't, there isn't the ability for other contributors or contaminants to get into that cooling loop, an ion chamber detector is aptly suited. Environment One manufactures a condition monitor for hydrogen cooled machines. In an air cooled generator, it's often an open or nearly open cooling path. And the detection system that's utilized has to be a very good mix of high sensitivity, yet false alarms, but yet immunity to false alarms due to dust and dirt. So between the two type of cooling systems, that hydrogen cooled system really keeps away dust and dirt and other external uh, variables, the air-cooled generator presents a, uh, a bit more of a challenge. And therefore, the detector itself needs to never, ever false alarm. The objective overall is always for us to detect an overheat or arcing event at the very onset of it, which will provide an operator with a chance to take corrective action. In this next slide, we look at the temperatures at which particles will begin to be released into a generator cooling circuit. In this list, you'll see a range from the first point being SAE 10 oil uh, down to the bottom of phenolic varnishes. Uh, these materials are not necessarily present in every generator. But there are certainly uh, there is a number of them that should uh, come to mind for any of the operators that are attending this webinar. We'd like to point out that oil is naturally not something that we would expect to see overheating in a generator because it shouldn't be there. But practical experience shows that oil does become present and it is uh, in a combustion event or if the oil is uh, overheating and burning, it represents a serious problem within the generator. The observation I would like to make here is that the threshold of 200 degrees C is pretty much the point where at a, on a given surface temperature, we will begin to see the release of submicron particles 
and those submicron particles are the key are the key item, invisible as they are, to the function of the generator condition monitor. So if we take this discussion on particles and particle generation and the particulation point uh, a step further, let's follow the path of in the event a particle is released, how do we detect them? And this is where we begin to play out on the title of tiny clouds being used to protect large generators. So let's take a, a couple more minutes on the nature of particles. This point probably centers in on one of the most critical observations or understandings regarding the generator condition monitor for an air-cooled machine. And that is uh, submicron particles are generated along an exponential curve in a thermal event or an arcing event. And what's really important to recognize is that there is no other phenomenon in nature that is going to pro produce particles in such numbers. So this has the relevance to, of uh, if there are particles present at, at massive amounts, there's only one way that they could be present, and that is through an overheat or arcing event. It is not possible to, let's say, take a handful of dirt or dust and create the number of particles that are being produced in an overheat. That makes it a very, very unique experience and one that, once focused on, provides unparalleled, uh, an unparalleled degree of early warning capability. The key with these invisible submicron particles that are being produced at the earliest portions of an overheat event is that we have to take those minute particles, which are invisible, and make them visible. By making them visible, or at least bringing them to the point where you can monitor them continuously, we're able to then provide a online continuous overheat monitor, and that's the GCMA's primary function. The GCMA is very much like an environmental monitor, and if we think about uh, the particle levels that are typically uh, evaluated whether it's pollen count or things of that sort. What we're looking at with the GCMA is just that rapid change or the absolute change in background from one level of particle concentration per milliliter of air to something that is massively different. The Wilson Cloud Chamber. This is the key tool for us in taking those invisible particles and making them into something that are able to be seen by a conventional or sun-eye conventional detector. Within the Wilson cloud chamber, a relatively simple process takes place and one that we see almost on a daily basis. In the coming slides, I'm going to uh, demonstrate to you what it's like to create tiny clouds and how they're used. I hope you'll tolerate. We're going to go from one slide. We may come back uh, between two slides just to make sure that this understanding of what's going on inside the cloud chamber is clear. In the simplest terms, if you take a humidified sample of air and you quickly cool it, if there are particles present, submicron particles present, the supersaturated air will form water droplets around those particles. And if you have enough particles or water droplets, you're going to create something that looks a lot like fog or a cloud. 
when those invisible particles become visible because they are surrounded by a water droplet or because they become a water droplet and we have a cloud present, the density of the cloud will have a relationship to the concentration of particles. This next slide is a cross-section of a cloud chamber. Oh, sorry about that, folks. If you can see the cursor, I am going to kind of walk you through how the cloud chamber works. So at this point, where it's, should we show an inlet port, as we are sampling air from an air-cooled generator, it comes into a chamber that has water and wicks. This allows us to supersaturate the air as it's coming through the humidifying chamber. The sample of air is then brought into the detector chamber, which is here. The air, once it reaches the chamber, is exposed to a pressure, and then the pressure is rapidly reduced. The process is called rapid expansion, and what is occurring is the air sample, as supersaturated as it is, undergoes a rapid cooling. And in the rapid cooling, the cloud is formed in this area. There is an LED and a photocell. When we have a cloud present here, this photocell would see a decreased amount of light from the LED. And again, this is where a, a cloud formation will relate to the concentration of submicron particles. We are going to come back to this in a moment because in the next slide I'm going to show you a demonstration of how the cloud is formed. Now I'm going to walk you through this first and we'll probably go through this a couple of times. What you're going to see is a, a kind of like a physics experiment you would have seen in college. We're going to light a match we're going to aspirate or breathe in above that match. What we are doing is bringing submicron particles, invisible particles, not smoke, submicron particles, into that flask. The flask has water at the bottom of it. So as we bring that air into the flask, it's going to become saturated. We'll then build up some pressure in the flask and then release the pressure. And you'll see what forms inside of the flask itself. So again, we're aspirating submicron particles. We pressurize the flask, release the pressure, and there you go. You see a cloud. Now that cloud is not smoke. It is small water droplets that are being formed around the submicron particle. I'm going to go back and show you it again. Aspirating the submicron particles, they become saturated or uh, humidified and saturated. We release the pressure and we have the cloud. Now, in this view, I want you to think about a small LED being on one side of that flask and a photo cell being on the other. The more particles we have in a given air sample, the denser that cloud would become in the chamber or in the flask. That is what's happening inside the cloud chamber. So I've come back to the previous slide just to kind of walk back through that process. We brought the air sample in, much like with the flask. It was humidified. It came, and while we did not have the porting, uh, or at least not a, a similar porting on the flask, once that air came in, we built up a pressure, we released the pressure, and right in this area, a cloud was formed. 
If we were monitoring this photo cell, we would have seen that the output of the photo cell would have decreased because of the obscuration between the LED and the photo cell. That's what we're doing in the GCMA once a second. And what we're doing there is continuously monitoring for the presence of submicron particles. I hope going back and forth uh, gave you a good enough uh, understanding of that. If we need to cover it back in the Q&A session, uh, we'll certainly do so. I'm going to move on past this demonstration slide and start to talk about the GCMA system itself. The GCMA is predicated on monitoring two separate zones or channels. One area is the ambient, the other is the generator cooling air. Warning and alarm levels are selectable for each one of these channels, and as I had mentioned, we are continuously monitoring for the presence of submicron particles in each. The primary function of the GCMA is to look at generator cooling air and ambient air and look for a differential between the two. So if the generator cooling air signal increases without a corresponding increase in an ambient signal, it is logical to conclude and it is, and the conclusion is that particles are being generated within the machine. In the event we do see an increase in particles within the generator cooling channel, and it is, a, it is at a significant difference between the ambient, a differential alarm will engage confirming the presence of generator overheating or arcing. But let's take a look at a couple of different configurations of air-cooled generators. This view is of a open loop or single pass once through cooling circuit. The application on this generator is as such. We have the GCMA indicated here in the upper left. We have the blue channel, which would be the cooling air or the inlet air monitor. And then the orange line is going to be looking at the exit or the exhaust of a, of a once through cooling circuit. So what we're looking at is if the inlet air particle concentration and the outlet air particle concentration are nearly the same, there's no overheating. If the outlet air channel increases in its output or particle concentration, we will be then able to conclude that there's overheating or arcing going on inside of the machine. In the next slide, we see what is probably a more typical air-cooled generator configuration where heat exchangers, or this might be called a enclosed or totally enclosed air-cooled generator. There's actually a sm uh, makeup filters on either each end of the generator or one end of the generator, so it isn't really fully sealed up. But in this example, you're going to be monitoring and, uh, the generator cooling air beneath the heat exchanger, which is often seen as a pit or a, you know, an open area beneath the heat exchanger. Here you'll see that we would be monitoring the ambient air outside of the generator case. We, can, we could refer to this as the control. And then we are monitoring the generator cooling air, which is then our rel uh, uh, relevant signal. The difference between these two would indicate problems within the generator. So let's move on to some generator design or system design considerations. First we need to understand that 
GCMA installations are site specific or generator model specific. Each generator or manufacturer of a generator will have a particular cooling circuit and that's an important thing for us to review and we'll see that in an upcoming slide. Beyond the generator cooling circuit, we also look to see the outline of the generator to understand where the detector unit and the GCMA cabinet would be mounted. Our next consideration is to determine the specific sampling system layout or piping network that will get us to be able to get our samples out and bring them back to the detector chamber or the cloud chamber itself. Another important point in this part is to be thinking about how do we penetrate the case or how are we going to be getting a sample line into the generator? Next we, and we'll talk about this a little later, and that is the use of a challenge device and particularly where its location might be. Finally, when the GCMA has been installed on a generator, it's important to understand that we want it to run for a, a period of time so that we can understand what the normal background particulate level is at the power plant. You recall me mentioning how the GCMA is much like an environmental monitor. Well, when it's first installed and commissioned, we want to determine what the background particulate level is because our alarm levels are then established relative to that. So let's just say that we have a normal output on a GCMA of 10 to 15 percent. Okay, that's great. If in, when we're setting an alarm level, we're going to want to have that considerably above background, and we're going to want to take into consideration things such as normal traffic patterns at the power plant. Because if you have, let's say, at 8 o'clock in the morning and 5 o'clock in the evening, we have the presence of a lot of vehicles coming in and out of the power plant. This will increase the ambient particulate level in the air, which will be seen external to the generator and then at some point in time on the, uh, within the generator. So if, the, if at a normal level, let's say prior to uh, 8 a.m., normal levels were at a 15% output on a GCMA, but right when everyone's showing up or a change of shift, it moves to 20%. Well, we would certainly want to make sure that the alarm levels are established somewhere in the 40 to 50% level. So let's look at some of the drawings and, and information that are used in configuring a GCMA system. I mentioned at first that we were going to look at the cooling circuit. This is a typical cross-sectional view of an air-cooled generator that shows us the various paths that air is expected to be flowing through uh, do, uh, in terms of its normal cooling path of the generator and then as it's coming through and across heat exchangers. We first want to know what is the expected cooling gas path because our location and, pre and location of sample probes is going to be directly related to that cooling circuit path. Where are the easiest locations to install ambient and generator sample points? Is a practical consideration. And does the generator case have any existing tapping points that we're going to be able to use to bring our sample probe for the generator air signal? We also talked about looking at the outline of the generator because every plant will have a particular desired location for the GCMA. We want to make sure that we understand what that location is, what the proximity to mechanical and electrical connections would be, if there are any obstructions, and to try to make sure that we have the shortest run of a sample line back to the detector. We'll also consider whether or not there are any ambient conditions that need to be looked into. For example, if the generator is, is at a plant that is a semi-indoor-outdoor 
insulation. We may need to look at rain protection or other uh, ambient weather protection. So this is the first set of drawings and design considerations that we're going to be reviewing with a power plant or an operator. It is typical that we will have some back and forth uh, discussing different options for installation of the unit insul and installation of the sampling systems. So let's look at the sampling system. In the left-hand view, you'll see that we have the GCMA unit. Right above them is uh, a couple of zone manifolds. We use zone manifolds to control and meter the flow of the air coming from the generator to the detector. This diagram shows an ambient signal with a couple of sample heads. So this is where we'd be getting that reference or ambient indication. And then the generator signal line, you'll see, comes to the box and then penetrates the wall and then in the left-hand uh, view forms an H probe. When it comes time for our sample probes, they're always a balanced system. So whether it is an H probe as seen on the left-hand side or a U-shaped probe, which is shown on the right-hand side, uh, what we are looking to do there is get an equal uh, contribution from various areas of the generator. I'd like to pause for a moment here uh, on these sample probes. A very important consideration for us in working with a plant is to get an understanding of what the dynamics are inside of the cooling pit or the sampling area. If it is known that a, the most dynamic airflow would be found in the middle of the, of the void beneath the heat exchanger, we would look to try to have the sample probe go to that point. We really want to have the sample probe in the most dynamic airflow possible. I'd mentioned before the challenge device. Now the challenge device, once a GCMA is installed, the challenge device would allow a plant operator to overheat a series of resistors. In this case, we use 100 watt resistors. The value here in a challenge device is that in the presence of a monitoring device, if you were to ask plant personnel, hey, this monitor just gave me an alarm, the first question that would be raised is probably, can we trust it? The only way to build the confidence is to be able to show and to demonstrate and practice, or let's say demonstrate the effectiveness of the GCMA against a known challenge. So in the lower right-hand corner, I just brought up a, a picture of an actual challenge device. And you'll see that it's a bank of six resistors, 100-watt resistors, that have epoxy uh, paint applied to them. What we're doing, and you can see a variac just below the, uh, the, the case there, what we would be doing is overheating one of those resistors and then looking for how quickly a GCMA will react to it. A challenge device is used as part of the commissioning of a GCMA. And in instances where a plant is willing to locate a challenge device within the generator itself, challenges can be done as part of a normal preventive maintenance or scheduled maintenance and testing regimen whereby the power plant at a known interval and with the control room being duly informed can perform an overheat test which will validate the performance of the GCMA. Next I want to show a little bit of information on some field tests that were performed on a 300 megawatt air-cooled unit. This unit was of the configuration that uh, I showed in the second slide, not a once-through cooling circuit, but 
a, an enclosed cooling circuit. We installed one of those 100 watt resistors in, the, in a challenge device and placed it in the pit of the generator. As you can see by the data, when we initiated the test, at approximately three or four minutes into the test, we brought the resistor to 200 degrees C. Again, at that point where we know the thermal particulation begins to occur, especially on an epoxy paint. This generator was not operating at the time, but we can see what the result of the GCMA, something short of three or four minutes uh, after the initiation of the test, we were in a between an 80 and 100% output of the GCMA. This demonstrated clear responsiveness of the GCMA system. It also validated that the sampling system was designed in a manner that allowed the sample to get back to the detector uh, without any kind of obstruction. We then moved in this same test scenario to the generator being in an operational mode. This, is, uh, this represented a fairly unique test for us uh, because we had a, the plant's permission to be able to install a challenge device within the pit of the generator. Similar test as with the 100 watt resistor overheat. We brought the temperature up to 200 degrees C and we'll see what the GCMA output signature was here. So in the area, if this alarm uh, level was set at between 60 and 80 percent, we would see that within a two to three minute period of time, a small overheat, 100 watt resistor being overheated, was able to be detected by the GCMA and the output was a significant output. Uh, this was not a, a, a low level at all. We had a rapid and significant change in particle concentration within the unit. The validation of this was important and will, this uh, set of data will be in an upcoming technical paper published by Environment One. In the event, uh, in many events, or should I say in, in many situations uh, in the past, it was common for utilities to promote or openly discuss failures. Uh, these days, unfortunately, it's not so popular of a thing to do, and we don't see a lot of releases of public information. We do have a couple of events, though, that we wanted to just share here. The first occurred at the Blackstone Power Plant which was an American national power plant in Blackstone, Massachusetts. We detected arcing and sparking from a slip ring assembly, which was detected by the ambient channel. This is kind of a rare type of thing. There was, there was uh, nobody present on the turbine deck at the time, but the alarm from the GCMA came into the control room. They dispatched a technician to the, to the generator where the slip ring box assembly was seen to be sparking. Uh, while not a common uh, failure mode, this certainly had relevance uh, to a future potential catastrophic failure as the slip ring box, if we was overexciting the generator, could have resulted in a failure. Next, and while we can't disclose the, the plant, we had an early detection of insulation damage caused by a foreign object. In this instance, it was a bolt that had uh, come loose and burned uh, the generator, and that was found after subsequent inspection. Finally, in the area of, uh, of a save, uh, there was a plant that had an intermittent GCMA alarm taking place. When E1 was contacted regarding that intermittent alarm, we asked whether or not there were any other monitoring systems uh, online. Flux probes were being used on this generator, and ultimately it was determined that the GCMA was a correlating and supporting monitoring system 
uh, that indicated a shorter turn. There's without question that these challenge, uh, the challenge testing as I had described previously has proven to be an important element in building confidence in the GCMA. We certainly think that uh, the GCMA in conjunction with other monitoring systems is the best thing to be doing for plant operators in their risk mitigation strategy. And we thank you very much for your time during the webinar. OK, thanks, Ron. We do have some questions that we need to address here. The first one is, is there any mandatory requirement of CO2 fire extinguishing systems for air-cooled generators where generator stator is with low resin F class insulation and global vacuum pressure impregnation? Well, uh, we can say that the, we're not aware of any particular uh, regulation in that area, but it's, I think it's important to note that given, in a given state a given, or a given country, uh, regulations may you know, vary from place to place. We certainly see CO2 systems on a, on a regular basis that, uh, for just overall fire protection and fire suppression, but I can't say that we're aware of a particular uh, regulation. OK, next question. Is this a continuous process, or is it a batch process? The GCMA is a continuous monitor. It, as a detector, it does time share between the generator uh, sample line and the ambient sample line. And it's probably best described uh, this way. The detector or the cloud chamber will monitor ambient air for 15 seconds, monitoring approximately once a second, so there will be 15 cycles. We will then move over to the generator sample, monitor it for 15 seconds. And then if you look at a third 15 seconds for the microprocessor to compare the data and to determine whether or not there has, is a sufficient differential between the two to indicate a problem. So it is continuously monitoring, but it does time share between the, the uh, generator and ambient sample heads. OK. Does all of the air have to be monitored? The, the way the system is designed, and particularly with regard to the dynamic airflow that's happening within the generator, if there is an overheat taking place, that dynamic airflow will help keep those submicron particles you know, flying around and keeping them dispersed. We are taking a sample. We are inserting a probe in that dynamic airflow. We are not taking 100% of the sample of air that's in the machine, of course. Uh, but the short, the short answer is we are bringing in approximately 14 liters per minute through each sample line. And that has been proven to be more than an adequate uh, sampling of of the air within the generator or in the ambient area to be sufficient for us to provide the protection. Thank you. Uh, next question, why would you need to monitor ambient samples? We need to monitor the ambient sample because it gives us the reference point or background level that we are comparing against. So let's say, for example, uh, there is uh, welding taking place within the power plant. If there is welding taking place in that power plant, the ambient level is going to be increasing, and, and the generator level would be increasing probably along the same lines or, or approximated. In the event you have an increase on both lines, we're not dealing with overheating coming from the generator. It's just an ambient condition. So that ambient uh, line is providing our reference. 
Uh, so it is, it is important. It provides the baseline against which we are measuring generator cooling air. I will point out that in the example of that uh, Blackstone American National Power Plant where we had the detection in the slip ring box assembly, that it was the ambient channel that detected it. So the GCMA not only providing a risk mitigation technology for the generator, it does provide uh, a general uh, fire detection and or event detection outside of the generator as well. Not its primary purpose, but that it does have a side benefit. Okay, next question. Was the 300 megawatt generator test on an open ventilated unit or TEWAC? It was on a TWAC unit. Okay, and would this system give you an idea of where the overheating is happening? That What a fantastic question. Uh, we are not able to tell an operator exactly where the overheat has taken place. In our hydrogen cooled uh, application, the generator com condition monitor for hydrogen cooled machines, or the GCMX, there is an uh, add-on product and system called GenTags. And these are chemically coated compounds that are mixed with generator paint and they are applied to varying uh, to, to surfaces within the generator. In the, in, with the presence of gen tags, you are able to tell or indicate the area of overheat, at least the general area in the generator. But again, that is, that is only used in a hydrogen cooled uh, application. We are currently field testing a device that would allow gen tags to be used in the air-cooled environment. Our initial testing has been positive, but uh, we, we certainly know that we want to have a very good depth of analysis and data before uh, bringing that product to market. But that is an excellent question, and it is uh, a direction that we are taking in further development of this great system. OK, thanks, Ron. Next question. Will the use of a GCMA sampling channel inside a generator casing violate the OEM's guaranteed clause? Another, another great question. Uh, we have not found uh, any generator OEM to have, place any restrictions on the use of the GCMA. Uh, the materials used for the sampling system probe are key. What you would want to uh, see is in the event in the event that there is uh, any concern, we can use high heat PVC, so a non-metallic uh, piping. Uh, and the piping that is used in uh, the sampling system is defined by the site or by the OEM. Uh, without question, we can say that the the largest installed base of GCMAs will be found on Siemens and Alstom manufactured machines, and neither of those OEMs have any, have any uh, uh, concern or restriction uh, on the use. They, they both will use a high heat PVC as a default within the generator case uh, or the generator uh, sample line. And quite often, plants will be using stainless steel tubing of one diameter or another for the ambient channel. OK, next question. What is the size of the cloud particles that are detected? The submicron particles that are produced uh, in a thermal event can range anywhere from uh, down to 0 0.002 microns to, let's say, one micron. Uh, and the one micron may be much larger than you would normally see. So the, the real value with the cloud chamber is that we are able to take that 0 0.002 micron particle, and by condensing a water droplet around it, we are making it visible. 
So that's a that's a great question. There's not we haven't been able to do any testing, and uh, and I don't really know how expensive it would be to try to characterize the size particle that is coming off of a given material when it is uh, at the early stages of thermal particulation. But uh, that range, we we certainly are uh, are confident through testing that had happened probably decades ago that uh, we can detect down to 0 0.002 micron. And again, it's only because the water droplet that's being formed on that particle. OK, we have time for one last question. How does cooling air filtration affect the relation between ambient air and cooling air concentrations? OK, so in the, in the area, so it's a filtration focused question. Uh, any filtration that's happening, in fact, on a TWAC generator, there'll be usually one uh, inlet air filter on the, on the end of the generator case. And uh, when it comes down to it, if there is filtration happening, it actually just makes the differential even greater. So it can only uh, assist in the performance of our system. But within the generator itself, which is that key area for us uh, to be looking at, there is no filtration going in uh, taking place within the heat exchangers. And even as the air passes through the heat exchangers, the size particles that we're looking for move through a heat exchanger the way we move through a doorway. So it does not represent uh, uh, any kind of a limitation on the system. That's a great question. OK, well, it looks like we've run out of time for today. If we didn't have a chance to get to your questions, please enter those in the brief survey that will pop up following the webcast. That concludes today's webinar, Utilizing Tiny Clouds to Monitor Large Air-Cooled Turbo Generators with Ron Brosnahan sponsored by Environment One Corporation. And finally, if you liked what you saw today and would like a more in-depth seminar on similar topics, Environment One Corporation is hosting a three-day symposium on August 1st through the 3rd in Schenectady, New York. I will be emailing information on that symposium along with the link for today's recorded session. Please check it out and consider joining us in August. This symposium does have a space limit so you'll want to sign up soon. The early bird discount is good through July 15th. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks, Ron.